Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. There seem to be three things in our world today that bring out our strongest and perhaps most unsolicited opinions. Those things are politics, pandemics, and parenting. I promise I'm only going to talk about one today. I think that might be all we can handle. Politics, pandemics, and parenting. Please open with me to Proverbs 22. Proverbs chapter 22, where we're going to find one of the most common, commonly cited, commonly referenced verses in all of Scripture on the topic of parenting. But today, I hope that we consider it with fresh eyes and with softer hearts. This verse, applied in unhelpful ways, may have done some damage. It's a good and godly principle, but applied in unhelpful ways, it can hurt. And so I'd like for us to look at it through the lens of all of Scripture and understand it well. So let's read Proverbs 22, 6, and then we're going to pray and ask the Lord to illuminate it for us. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is our reading of God's holy word. May he write its truth on our hearts. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for worship today. I pray, Lord, that you would soften our hearts and open our eyes to see beautiful things in your law. Lord, your apostle John in his third letter said that he had no greater joy than to see that his children are walking in the truth. And I pray, Lord, that would be the same for us. I pray that your word would be a balm to our souls while still being a challenge to us. Lord, be with me. May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight and yours alone, my rock and my redeemer. It's in your precious name that I pray. Amen. Perhaps it stings a little bit for you to even hear the words of this verse, train up a child in the way he should go. Maybe you know the pain of raising a child who has walked away from Jesus. Or maybe you know the pain of raising a child who has walked away from you, walked away from your family. Maybe you are that child. Maybe some of you do not have kids. But this word from Scripture today is not just for others in the room or a small select few of our congregation. Because all of us, at the end of the day, are children. We are all children. And how we live out of that identity shapes so much of the shape of our life. So much of our life. Yes, you are a child of your parents. You're a child of your family of origin. But the question today is, are you a child of God? Are you a child of God? Of God. So let me start today to say that no matter where you are today, no matter where you find yourself, I'm really glad that you're here. It is not my hope today to put any kind of man-made burden on shoulders that are already carrying so much. Either heavy-laden parents or exasperated children. No matter how old, no matter how young. That is not my desire. Rather, my hope is to see Jesus use this to invite you to take his yoke and his burden, which compared to the man-made heavy burdens we place on ourselves when we think about parenting, when we think about raising kids, and the sinful yoke and burden we place on others, that burden is life-givingly easy and light, isn't it? That's our hope today, that Jesus would invite us into something new. So, today there's freedom and responsibility for us at the foot of the cross as we look at this proverb. Our prime concern is not skill in parenting. Our prime concern is not even obedience in children, and that may surprise us a little bit. Our prime concern today is is walking the way of our Savior. Walking the way of our Savior, who was raised, taught, loved, and even learned obedience from His Father. 
That's our hope today. So, where are you? Which way are you going? No matter how old, no matter what your situation in life is, we're not just talking about families with kids here. Where are you? Which way are you going? Friends, no one drifts towards God. No one wanders into the way of the kingdom. And yet, God finds us. He leads us. And He uses one another to lead us there. It is not natural, instinctual, or easy for us to find communion with God. And our children will not find it in themselves, in discovering their own journey. It is not easy to find communion with God or peace in the parent-child relationship, is it? And yet, by the grace of God, it's possible, isn't it? Praise be to God for His grace to us in Jesus Christ. It is possible to find peace. So, there are three invitations for us today. Remember the way of wisdom. Reconsider the way of a child. And return to the way of Jesus. Let me say those again. Remember the way of wisdom. Reconsider the way of a child. And return to the way of Jesus. First, remember the way of wisdom. Anytime we parachute into a text like this, one, one verse, we, we run the risk of interpreting it in isolation without understanding the lay of the land around it, right? We can't just focus in on something without zooming out a little to see what's actually going on around. To understand the genre of Proverbs best, we need to remember that it's principles of wisdom passed on from really a king to his son, Right? So when King David passed the kingdom on to King Solomon, he was passing on a responsibility to protect and to lead Israel in light of God's covenant. Protect and lead Israel in light of God's covenant. And so then as Solomon is writing to his son, that's the context of Proverbs. How can I be a good king? How can I walk wisely in light of the Lord? How can I live well? How can I follow God? How could I be a good king? And so it shouldn't be surprising for us that when we look at that word wisdom that shows up over and over and over again in the book of Proverbs, it translates out as skill. What wisdom is, is living skillfully in light of God's covenant love for us. Living skillfully in light of God's love for us. By writing down principles of skillful living in light of our union with God, the king prepares his son for life, raising him for responsibility, for wisdom, for ultimately wisdom. When God our Father and God our King comes to us, he gives us both his covenant love, right? His unfounding, committed, unbreaking love for us, but he also gives us covenant law. He brings to us covenant love and covenant law. Parenting experts might call this uh, love and limits, right? Giving a child limits within a loving, safe structure. He gives us his love, his law, and he teaches us to walk in them. So what the, the message of Proverbs could be summarized as such, God gives us safety, structure, care, and loving discipline in the covenant, so then walk this way. Walk this way. And what Proverbs does over and over and over again is it compares and contrasts the two ways that a child can go. A child can walk in the way of righteousness and wisdom, or a child can walk in the way of foolishness. A child can walk in the way of justice, or a child can walk in the way of injustice and wickedness. One is walking with God, living with skill that comes from a heart that's rooted and grounded in the love and limits of God. Can you feel that? Rooted and grounded in the love and limits of God. There's safety, there's freedom there. The other is rejecting the love of God and disregarding His limits. Two ways to live, wisdom or foolishness. 
And it's important to remember for us that Proverbs, the book itself, and the genre of wisdom literature is by nature generally true. Proverbs is not law. And thus it does not make absolute promises. Here's an example. Proverbs 15.1 says this, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Right? We know this to be true. And even non-Christian relational experts have shown that a soft startup coming into a conversation with, a so- with softness and gentleness is the foundation for a healthy interaction, right? But we also know that a soft answer does not always turn away the wrath of someone who is intent on voicing that wrath. Just read the comments section on a political post or a pandemic post. Oh, wait, I said I would only talk about one. We know that a soft answer generally turns away wrath, but it does not always. It's still true. It's still a godly principle, but it's not an absolute promise of the outcome. Does that make sense? It's not an absolute promise of the outcome. So, if, if we approach Proverbs 22.6 and expect some kind of guaranteed success, if we train our kids a certain way, we are setting ourselves up for profound disappointment at best or deadly pride at our own skill in parenting or even spiritual abuse at worst. Let me say that again. If we approach Proverbs 22.6 as an absolute promise of outcomes, if we do something a certain way, we are setting ourselves up for profound disappointment at best, spiritual abuse, deadly pride at our own works, our own skill in parenting at worst. Good parenting does not guarantee the outcome of children, spiritual or otherwise. Consider Isaiah 1-2. The Lord has spoken. Children I have reared and brought up but they have rebelled against me. God himself raised Adam, Eve, Israel as his sons and daughters. Friends, look at me. The quality of the parenting was not the issue. Do you hear me? The quality of their parenting was not the issue. They had the best father. So what's going on here? Let's turn to the text and let's see if there's another way to understand this important principle. So we've seen, we've remembered the way of wisdom. Let's turn and reconsider the way of a child. Most English translations render it for years, centuries, kind of what we see here in the ESV. But Gordon Hugenberger and other Hebrew scholars have pointed out that in the Hebrew, this verse has some built-in ambiguities, right? Some ambiguous language that doesn't translate well into English, that if we don't take them into consideration, we can read this dogmatically in a way that it's not helpful, right? Let's, let's zoom in a little bit and see what we're, what we're looking at. We'll get into the weeds a bit and focus on two English words that we need to put under the microscope. This word train, train up a child in the way he should go, and then the phrase, the way he should go. We're going to look at train, and we're going to look at the way he should go. The word here that's translated as train is rarely translated that. It most naturally refers to beginning or dedication or initiation or inauguration. Imagine someone dedicating a temple or dedicating a building, right? This is the purpose for which this is built. This is what this is for. About 17 times it's used, and most of the time it's used, that's what it has to do with, dedication or inauguration or initiation. So why does this matter? This may have more to do with a parent's posture towards the identity of their child than the activity of training that child. Training or dedicating or initiating has to do with the beginning of their life. The parent's posture towards that child's identity more than the activity or training of that child. The point here is that the beginning of a child's life, the initial path, the initial, initial way of a child's life matters in the long run. The purpose and direction of a child influences and shapes their life. 
Next, look at me, look with me. The, the second part of the first part of the verse, in the way he should go. Without getting too deep in here, what's important for us to know is that there's really no reason for us to insert that English word should. This is just third person singular, in his way. If there's any English word we need to insert here, it's his own way, like possessive. Dedicate or initiate a child in his own way. And even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Putting these two pieces together, we may be surprised to find that this proverb is not a promise for good parenting. It's actually an ironic imperative. It's actually telling us to do the opposite of what we should do. In a way, it's sarcastic. And this actually has precedent. This is, this, we see this at other points in Scripture. Proverbs 19.27 says, Stop listening to instruction, my son and you will stray from the, my words of knowledge. Cause, consequence. Have any of you ever interacted with a toddler that absolutely wants to do the very opposite of what you tell them to do? With one of ours, we found that instead of telling them, sit down in your chair or stop standing up in your chair, we flipped and we started saying, stand up in your chair one more time and your toy will go into timeout. And at that point, they're like, okay, then I sit down. Telling the opposite to be true and showing us what happens if we were actually to do that. An ironic imperative. Friends, the point here is that the habits and the allegiances of the human heart are hard to break. Your family of origin has lasting effects on our hearts, our minds, and our souls. And the same is true of the children, your children and your family, the children growing up in this church who grow into adults who might have children of their own one day. So as we look at this verse, we need to hear both the good news and the hard news. The good news and the hard news. 22.6, Proverbs 22.6 is not a promise of good outcomes for good parents. This is good news for many of you operating under the weight of, of believing that your children are a reflection of your performance as a parent. That is a burden that you cannot bear. Many a wonderful parent has been left heartbroken. However, the hard news is that this is a warning and that there are consequences for abdicating our responsibility to raise, to lead, to actively and not passively bring up our children. It's a warning against letting them follow the natural inclinations of their heart, or remaining passive and not leading them in the way of Jesus. What happens in childhood matters in the long run, and the way we treat them shapes them. The way we treat children shapes them. So we are not responsible ultimately, but we are responsible temporally. We are not responsible ultimately, we are responsible temporally. Friends, we all must be taught. The way of Jesus, the way of righteousness must be modeled. Skillful living for our children, righteousness, wisdom, good decisions, however valuable there is something more weighty on the table for us today. There's something, something much more weighty than just skillful living and good outcomes. Our children will not wander into communion with God. They will not wander into the way of Jesus. Redeemer, all of us are bent towards sin, heart, mind, soul, and strength. And perfect parenting will not remedy this. Perfect parenting will not remedy our sin problem. Kids need a rescue that is outside of our power and outside of our control. And we as, as, as adults are not exempt. None of our public righteousness, none of our wisdom, none of our good deeds, none of our right thinking, none of our loving disposition deals with the fact that without intervention, we will follow the natural path of our hearts into spiritual death. 
Without intervention, we will follow the natural path of our hearts into spiritual death. We've gotten deep into the bad news for a second here. Where do we go from here, right? We've hit rock bottom at this point in the sermon. Who is sufficient for these things? We have nowhere to go except to return to the way of Jesus. When we see this reality, we have nowhere left to go but to return to the way of Jesus. So parents, hear me. You are not sufficient for your children. You are responsible. You are called to not spiritually, emotionally, or physically neglect or abuse them. This is a high calling. However, at the end of the day, we are not sufficient. And if we're honest with ourselves, we feel this. If you saw me low-key bawling my eyes out in the middle of Highland Village this week, it's because I was reading Wright Thompson, a sports writer, talking about the prospect of raising children having, not having his father there. And he writes this, I want to know how to be a good daddy. What should I let my son do? What should I tell him about crossing the street, about sex, how to, to remove a splinter, how to make him love you more than life itself? I know he'd know the answers, especially to the last one. How do we do this? Friends, this is the way that kids would know the perfect love of a father that loves them more than life itself. That our goal, our ultimate goal for our children is that they would return that love to him, loving him more than life itself. Your hope is not in being perfect fathers and perfect mothers. If we're looking for wisdom in raising children, we look to the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Friends, Jesus is wisdom personified. Wisdom in parenting is not found in a particular program. It is found in a person. There is so much pressure to pick which group of research we will follow, which book I will use, which perspective I will raise my children from. Friends, wisdom in parenting is not found in a particular program. It is found in the person of Jesus Christ. It's time for us to stop taking so much credit for our kids' outcome and their behavior, good or bad. And start boasting in the Father who is their good shepherd. Not boasting in our own skill or which camp we have decided to land on. Then we can take on the responsibility and hard work of becoming an under-shepherd. And what this might look like is taking a hard look at the past. Our own past. Our own mistakes. Turning in repentance and faith and owning it. And then looking forward to a better way. Seeing tomorrow as a new day, no matter where we have been. And so in the time that we have left today, I just want us to take a look at a few takeaways. We've zoomed in on one scripture to reconsider it, so let's zoom back out to do justice with what the scope of the gospel tells us about what it means to be parents and ask the question, where do we go from here? So here are seven things. One, Start with yourself. Paul tells the Ephesians, be imitators of God as beloved children. Be imitators of God as beloved children. Whether you have kids or not, like we've said, your prime identity is that of a child of God. Imitate Him. Walk His way. Imitate Him. What does that look like? Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Friends, obedience is love in that at the end of the day, all obedience is, is imitating Jesus. Are you tracking with me? Obedience is love 
And that all obedience really is at the end of the day is imitating our Savior, imitating Jesus. When we ask a child to obey us, we're asking them to do what we do. How confusing for a child would it then be for a parent to demand them to do something that they are not willing to do first? If they are not willing to do first. If we want beloved children, our first step is becoming a beloved child. If we want spiritual formation for our kids, we must be spiritually formed and conformed to our Savior first. We have to start with ourselves, otherwise we're going to make it about ourselves. You know this, living vicariously through your children. If we are making it about ourselves, we will be on cloud nine when they perform, when they behave, and when they succeed, and we will be crushed when they fail. If it is about us, we will be anxious about their health and life and safety and future. Friends, imitate Jesus first. If parenting becomes about our own success or fulfillment, we will become cynical and weary of it. We will become cynical and weary of it. This is the the same is true of marriage. If it is about our own success and fulfillment, we will grow weary and cynical of it. The same is true of sex. However, as we imitate Jesus, these things do become fulfilling as they reflect the deep union and connection and unbreakable commitment of a covenant. Marriage, parenting, sex, any of it is meant for covenant. Otherwise, we become weary and cynical. Proverbs 14, 26 says, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. His children will have a refuge. Friends, our kids will find safety and rest as we find safety and rest in our refuge. Start with your own heart before you ever concern yourself with someone else's, including your child's. So first, start with yourself. Next, set the path. Set the path. Deuteronomy 6 says, These words that I command you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. As we walk in the way, the truth, and the life, we are setting the course for our family the rhythms and habits of our life simultaneously reveal and form our values as a family. The things that we do show what we truly love and what we are truly about. And so friends, as we walk the way of wisdom in Jesus, we aim for more than health. We aim for more than wealth. We aim more for more than success in school and sports which groups our children get into, what opportunities they have. Setting the path towards Jesus is so much more than what music we let them listen to, what movies we let them watch, whether we homeschool, private school, public school, whether we're on the travel soccer team or whether we have perfect attendance at church. It is so much more than this. These externals, They matter, and like I said, they do shape what's important to our family, but no child was ever ushered into the kingdom of God through superficialities. No child was ever ushered into the kingdom of God through superficialities. That your child would enjoy a good life, make wise decisions, and become a well-adjusted adult is fantastic and good, and a great goal. But in the words of Jesus, what does it profit a kid if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? It's appropriate for us to ask, what do the habits and rhythms of our families reveal about what we truly value? A few studies have shown that telling stories to our kids is a profound um, agent for bonding between parent and child. We know this. That's what parents do with kids. We read stories to them. We tell them stories. The question for us today is what story are we telling? What story are we telling our children? What story is their subculture telling them? 
whether that subculture be the Christian subculture, white subculture, black subculture, conservative subculture, progressive subculture. What story are we telling them? What story is their subculture telling them? And are we challenging that with the story of Jesus? Are we weighing that against the story that we've been given in His Word? Friends, tell them the story when you lie down and when you rise, in the formal moments and the informal moments. Tell them His worth. Tell them His work. Show them who Jesus is in the story of your life by telling Him the story. Read them His Word. Tell them His stories. Tell them His stories. Show them how His story shapes our life. Tell stories about how He loves them more than life itself and nurture them to reciprocate that love. Third, lead with compassion. Lead or start with compassion. Psalms 103, 13 and 14 tells us, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Friends, children are learning and growing. They don't know how to regulate. They don't know how to engage this world. And they're learning this from you. Be patient. Have compassion on them. And remember that it's the Lord's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's kindness that leads us to repentance. Lead with compassion. Fourth, discipline in love. Discipline in love. Proverbs 19, 18 says, Discipline your son, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to his death. Oof, that one hits hard. Hebrews 12, 6, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Friends, loving correction gets our attention and reorients our assumptions about ourselves and the world around us. And this is one of the ways that God loves us, isn't it? Loving correction. Love your children by giving them limits, not following the natural course of their hearts. Giving them everything they naturally want is not loving to them. It is also not loving to discipline them in anger. Out of our own anger, seeking conformity to our own will, out of a place of our own pain and our own disappointments. I'm seeing some heads nod right here, right? This flows into the next point. Number five, do not exasperate your children. Paul tells children in Colossians and Ephesians to obey. And kids in the room, look at me. This is the only commandment with a promise of blessing, obeying your parents. But then he turns to parents and says, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate your children. One of the worst ways I exasperate my children is by modeling for them what it looks like to be exasperated with someone. What it looks like to model. When I become angry over my own inconvenience, annoyance, exhaustion, and selfishness. On Thursday, driving to school, my four-year-old son from the back seat says, out of nowhere, I'm just driving, he says, pick a lane and stay in it. I don't know where I heard that. No clue. It was probably Daniel Tiger or something. Couldn't have been me, right? Pick a lane and stay in it. Another time, my daughter draws a picture for me. I drew a picture of you, Daddy, and she comes and she gives it to me, and it's me laying on the couch watching TV. <laughs> they learn from us. They're listening. Do what we do. If you are a parent or a grown, exasperated child, the only repentance we can move towards is our own, right? We can't control another person's heart. 
We must be the chief repenter. We cannot expect our children to own up or apologize for their sins if they've never observed their parents doing the same. If I am always right and I never apologize, will my child know what it looks like to own up to things and apologize? No. How can I expect them to do that if I am never wrong? Model for them what you hope to see in them, friends. Model for them what you hope to see in them. I have to be the chief sinner in my family, consequently the chief repenter if I'm the chief sinner. If I want my family to see the safety and freedom of their own repentance. I've got to model it for them. They need to see that daddy needs Jesus. Number six, do not give up. It is never too late. Do not give up. It is never too late. You may be tempted to think that ship has sailed. I missed my window. My children are too old. I've messed up. And though Proverbs 22, 6 does say it is hard for a child to change course if they have been given their own way, given over to their own way, we believe a gospel from Isaiah 53 that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way, and yet the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. We have a gospel of people who have strayed, who have been brought back, and a Savior who leaves the 99 to find the one. This is why it's such good news that Proverbs are not absolute promises, that it's generally true, but that anyone can return. Anyone can return. Your child is not too old. There may still be hope for repair in the relationship, no matter if they're an adult or they're a teenager. There may be very real wounds, and we cannot take that lightly. There may be very real hurts, and reconciliation may not be possible. However, even prodigals like you and me, can turn in faith and repent. The good news is that anyone can come home. And even if they don't, we trust that they have a better Savior and a better shepherd than we could ever be. And we have a better Savior, they have a better Savior and a better shepherd who often moves in mysterious ways. Do not give up. It's never too late. And finally, you are not alone. Sometimes leading our children to Jesus means admitting that we are not enough and asking for help while living in community, right? Living here in the church and be willing to say, I need help. In the church, humbly inviting others to fill the gap and allowing people to keep their baptism vows that they made a promise to assist this parent in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And friends, those of you who do not have children, this is one way that we can all raise children in the Lord, by keeping those covenant vows. I saw this at work recently. My son was playing soccer, wasn't into it. First two games, he was weepy, very intimidated, very overwhelmed, didn't even play. In the middle of the third game, we're about to go into thermonuclear meltdown on the field. Okay, it's about to get real bad. And I walk up to him, but then the coach of the other team walks up to him. We were playing against another, with this four-year-old boys from Redeemer. We have two whole teams worth of four-year-old boys for Redeemer. I'm huffing and puffing, wearing my mask out on the field. And I walk up to my son, but then I see this other coach come up, and I, see, I catch Kristen's eye, and she motions away. And I know exactly what she's saying. She's like, don't be dad right now. Don't be dad right now. The man who walked up, the coach of the other team, has known my son since he was in nursery, and he always got him. Even when Kristen and I were exasperated, it's like he understood him and appreciated him. And he kneels down, and I'm back away, and I watch for a second, and I have no idea what he says to him. 
But as soon as he's done, my son transforms again into a powerhouse of fearless joy, who is who I truly know him to be, right? This is why I need the covenant community. I need someone else to back up what I'm saying. That it's not all about me being successful. That I can step out of the way and let someone else point my child in the right direction. We've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. In fact, I think this was the last point of another sermon I preached earlier in the year. I don't care. It bears repeating. Friends, reparent one another in this Christian community. Refamily one another in the body of Christ because no matter what kind of family you come from, we are now family here and there can be healing here. There can be healing here. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 For you know how like a father with his children we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. My heart did not wander into the kingdom of God or the way of Jesus. I had to be led there, first by my Father in heaven, then by my earthly mother and father, and now by you. Good luck with that, everybody. (laughs) I'm being reparented, rebrothered, and sistered by all of you. That is our calling and our privilege. Lead one another there in the way of Jesus. Lead our covenant children to follow the way of Jesus. But first, turn in repentance and faith to be led by the kind, compassionate, and firm hand of a father. No one in this room, no one watching from home is outside of his reach, and none of our children are outside of his reach. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess our inadequacy and we rejoice in your sufficiency. Lord, we are in all kinds of different places here. Overwhelmed parents, exasperated children, old, young. But Lord, we're all in the same spot. I pray, Lord, that we would be children of God. Thank you for that promise. Thank you for loving us. We need your help. Most of all, thank you for Jesus, who was a perfect son on our behalf. You are a good father. A good, good father. And it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen.